right, here we go. Three, two, one. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome, everybody. This is Copabe Playball, a special edition with baseball outside the box. Welcome, everybody in the U.S. and around the world. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. We are in over 100 countries, and it's all because of you. Cannot thank you enough. Hey, we're not going to waste any time because baseball's going, and we are excited. MLB, we got a great friend of ours from the fantastic island of Curacao. Of course, he's not Curacao. He's in spring training. And I've said it a thousand times, he needs to be a major league manager, no doubt in my mind. Um, but right now, he is the Yankees assistant hitting coach, the powerful New York Yankees. He's a former major league player, Dutch manager for the World Baseball Classic, Sir Hensley Mullins. Um, welcome to the show. What's up, buddy? Hey, Peter. How are you? Um, thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be on your show. Um, I just want to say hello to everybody that's watching and listening, and um, we have a good show for you guys. Well, I appreciate it, man. And, and I know folks, just so you know, Hensley's in spring training, how that goes. Not a lot of time, and spring training starts early in the morning now, a lot earlier than it usually does, because, you know, there's only so many weeks, and they got to ramp everything up, get, get things going. Hey, before I go with the rapid questions, um, excited? You got to be excited. Back in uh, Major League Baseball? Oh, definitely. You know, I took a year off last year and, um, you know, you don't know um, how much you're going to miss something until you miss it, until you're not in it. And, um, you know, thank God uh, the Yankees um, offered me this this position as assistant hitting coach to help out with the offense um, and try to bring back a, a championship to the Bronx. So I'm very excited is where I started as a player uh, 37 years ago. Um, so, you know, they say the circle is round, so it came all the way back around. <laughs> Absolutely. And, folks, we're going to put – obviously, Hensley's got a tremendous background in coaching, What a, just a super individual, um, and, you know, played in Japan. But, you know, we'll put that on the show notes so you can check out his background. It's fantastic. We're thrilled for him. Hey, let's go real quick on this. And, I, and obviously, one of the most common questions you get probably all the time, Bam Bam, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I need to answer that question in every interview I have all the time, which, which is fine because um, not everybody listens every time. So the people that haven't heard it before, you know, I was playing softball uh, back home in Curacao. I was, I was about 14 or 15 um, and, and I was a right-handed hitter um, in baseball. Uh, and I was on our national team uh, uh, in the senior division um, of Little League. So I didn't want to mess with my right-handed swing and, and softball. So I started hitting left-handed. And um, naturally, I was I was strong. So I was hitting some bombs over the fence, uh, farther than the natural left-handed hitters. And my my friends uh, uh, thought I was as strong as a Batman from the Flintstones walking around with the club. So <laughs> they started calling me Batman then. Um, and then a few years later, I was signed by the Yankees. I was 18 then. Um, and I came to um, Florida. Uh, Sarasota to play my, my first uh, professional season in the Gulf Coast League. And there was a person that came by to, um, you know, to, to he had a, a form that you had to fill um, with your hobbies, your names and, and things like that, nicknames. And um, I, uh, I left the nickname part blank. And then he took my sheet and he says, he said, uh, what, you know, Hensley Mullins has got to be a, a nickname associated with this. And I said, well, my friends back, back home call me Bam Bam. And then he put it in and then the rest is history. Yeah, awesome. And, uh, you know, for our folks in Copabe, Copabe, North, Central, South America, the Caribbean islands, you know, it covers all that area. They may not know that. And, and the other part is, sir, uh, talk about that. How'd you get the sir part? That's awesome. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lifetime achievement award um, that's um, um, given out to from from the Queen of uh, Netherlands to um, people that have done uh, great things in over their lifetime, um, and so by winning the championships and and winning uh, a, a lot of um, uh, three championships with the, with the Giants in the major leagues and then other championships in my minor league career and also winning the championship in Japan and um, also doing the, all, the, all the good deep things we do with the Curacao Baseball Week in Curacao, giving back clinics to um, all 1,200 kids that play baseball in Curacao every year. 
so things like that were important uh, to the queen, and um, I got I got knighted um, uh, in front of forty thousand people right at home plate wow. at 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 and T Park in San Francisco right before a game. And, um, you know, that was a memorable moment and uh, I'll never forget it. And it was uh, um, quite an honor to be knighted uh, in front of so many people um, in San Francisco. Wow. Awesome honor. Um, hey, speaking about kids, as a kid, uh, you know, what sports you play? Uh, I played, uh, well, naturally I played so uh, soccer because my dad was the captain of the national soccer team. Um, until this date, my dad was on a team that won the only um, gold medal at the Central uh, American Games um, in 1962, before I was born even. Uh, so, um, you know, when, when I was born and I have a younger brother that's a year and a half younger than me, he naturally put us in soccer right away. And um, we played soccer until, uh, me anyways, until I was 16, I uh, played four different sports. I played volleyball, I played softball, and uh, uh, I played baseball. Um, I started playing baseball around nine or 10 years old. And then by the time I was 16, uh, I, I was getting a lot of interest from uh, Major League Scouts. And I was getting kicked around a lot in soccer. So I disappointed my dad and I dropped soccer softball and and volleyball and and stuck with uh baseball for the last two years that i was an amateur and then i was signed by the new york yankees in uh on october 31st uh 1985 yeah it looks like you picked the right sport but you know it's obvious it's sometimes it's mostly obvious you asked that quite i asked that question but it was it your favorite sport well, you know, baseball was uh, big in uh, Curacao at that time. I was starting to um, get some get some fume, but soccer was the biggest sport. And obviously, um, with my dad being such a big star uh, himself, you know, we tried to follow his his footsteps. Um, as you know, back then there was not there was no cable, um, there was no cell phones, there was no no electronics to watch things on your phone or nothing like that or iPad or anything like that. So we got maybe one game a week on the Saturday day game of the week. So it was like one o'clock every, every Saturday. And most of the time, you know, the Yankees would be on there or the Dodgers or the White Sox, one of the big market teams. Yeah. Um, and so I was a Dodger fan at that time um, growing up, but then got signed by the rival uh, New York Yankees. But, you know, uh, I, I, I became to love baseball um, after, um, you know, ages 13 14 somewhere in there where i knew i had the chance to uh become pretty good at it and a professional perhaps but you know at that time there was only one other guy signed on the island so people weren't thinking about getting signed or being professional or going to the states or nothing like that you were thinking going to europe to amsterdam or to um, the netherlands and play soccer in a, in a, in a professional team so um, I was one of the few guys that decided to to go the other way, and it turned out to be pretty good. Absolutely. You know, you had the honor. I call it an honor, but a great country to play in Japan. Um, what did you learn playing in Japan? Most important thing. Well, uh, great culture, great people, very respectful people. Um, you know, I, I learned a different language. I learned um, to eat different food, and um, I, I learned that you know, there was a, a, a different way of, of doing things. Um, you know, over over here, everybody seems, seems to get mad at everything. But <laughs> there, there was only one person getting mad, was the boss, and everybody was had to follow what he said. And, um, you know, guys are very respectful, and I uh, was treated with, with um, like a king, uh, me and my family. Um, you know, I've been to Japan 12 times, so anytime I get a chance to go, I'll, go, I'll hop on the plane and go. Would you say... Uh, we would you say mentally tough? Uh, because, you know, they, like you said, they handle themselves well under pressure, it seems like. Yeah. And, and you know, not only that, the, the, the pressure was different. You know, the pressure was different because they didn't want to make mistakes. Um, um, elsewhere in the world, you make mistakes and it's fine. You know, over there you make mistakes. You know, it's, it, has, it has different consequences. You know, you get, you get sent out or you get released or, you you know, you... Um, you were punished, uh, yeah. so to speak, you know, so, but, but, you know, I learned a lot over there. 
And I've seen, you know, I remember, I, I don't know if they still do, but I remember in the old days, a manager wasn't afraid to pull it out. An outfielder did something wrong, man. They'd pull him out in the middle of the game, right in the middle of the inning. You know, I mean, that would never happen. Yeah. Never happened. Well, How about so it happened. Move? It happened so many times in the games. Yeah. Like in the first inning, the pitcher will give up three, four runs, and the the manager will call timeout and pull the catcher out. You know, it's like you're calling the wrong game. <laughs> That's awesome. How about favorite yeah. Japanese food? What's your favorite one? Oh man, it's it's hard to pick. You know, it's it's um so many great food over there. Uh. You know, but I like the teppanyaki where they cook in front of you. I like the sushi. Um, I like the okonomiyaki, where is the you know the Japanese pancake. Um, yeah. Uh, I can I can name a list of them, but the, those are the the ones that come to mind right now. Well, hey Hensley, uh, you know, as a coach in the big leagues and the minors, I mean, all you know, you are a person who speaks multiple languages. What are those languages? Uh, because they help with baseball, obviously. Well, I grew up speaking Papimento and Spanish at home because my mother is Dominican. Um, and when I was born, she had only been in Curacao for about three, four years. So she wasn't, she, she didn't master Papimento or any, any other language yet. So um, uh, my siblings and I all learned to speak Spanish from a young age, from the time I was born with my mom. And uh, Papimento, you spoke at home all, uh, everywhere in, in um, Curacao. And then once you got into school, at ages six, you started getting Dutch because that was that's the main language still. So you get everything in school is in Dutch. And then, um, you know, when you get to fifth grade, you start getting English and Spanish as a must. For me, Spanish was already in there because of my mom and, and, and um, um, that background. But then, you know, we started getting English. So by the time, you know, I was eight, seven or eight, I spoke four languages fluently already. Wow, that's got to help tremendously, especially with all the international players coming in. Um, that's got to help a lot. How about, and this is a tough one, how about the greatest, your greatest feat in the game of baseball, the greatest thing that ever, you know, you've ever accomplished, you feel good about? So, um, I mean, again, there are so many, you know, over the last 36 years or so. Um, but I think um, the greatest one is is uh, becoming the first major leaguer from Curacao that played that played in um, in MLB. Um, before I made it on August twenty third, nineteen eighty nine, nobody else had played a single game in the major leagues from from the islands. Um, the Netherlands did all the islands: Curacao, Aruba, Bonaire, Saint Martin, Stabia, Station. Those are the Dutch islands, and um, you know that I I I was very proud to be able to do that. And I'm still, still proud today, um, 32, 33 years later. So, um, and then open the door for all the other great guys that came, the Andrew Joneses, the Randall Simons, the, the Jair Jurgens, um, you know, the, the guys today, Kenley, Profar, um, Simmons, uh, Didi, um, all beasts who won the World Series last year. Um, you know, you can go on and on on the Jonathan scope. So we have six major leaguers right now, which makes us per capita, you know, the, 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 the country that produces more major leaguers with well, 150,000 people. Yes. And people are going to think this thing was all, all scripted and it was not because what I was going to lead into right away was here you are Curacao, 150,000 people per capita, the most major leaguers. So tell us. Because you know it's important even for where everybody in Copabe. Obviously, you mentioned all, all the things you do to help kids in baseball there on the island. I've been there actually, you know, saw everything that you do. It's incredible. But talk about why Curacao is producing these type of players. What are you doing right at especially maybe even at the grassroots level? What are some of the ideas that you guys have that others can maybe learn from? Uh, well, you said it right. I think, Peter, you know, we, we invest time in, in our um, volunteers because we call them volunteers, our coaches at, at the young ages um, that teach our, our kids to play the game. And, and it could be a father, it could be a mother, it could be a grandmother, it could be a grandfather, it could be, you know, any of the above, you know, people with um, that perhaps didn't play the game themselves. But, you know, we, we bring these seminars to them every year so they can learn from people like you that that's done a great job um, 
um, educating our our people, our volunteers, um, what they should be teaching our kids. And um, um, you know, we're talented. Uh, you know, I think it's natural talent that we have there, raw talent. Um, but we need to refine it, and refining it is is the toughest job for all these coaches and and volunteers. And without the um, these seminars and and the, the the experience they get and the um, what they get to learn from everybody we bring in every year, um, it's harder to do. And I think uh, if you can see over the last 35 years, 30, 35 years that we've been doing these clinics, um, how much the game has grown in Curacao. Because before that, nobody knew where Curacao was located. Even now, a lot of people don't even know where Curacao is located until they start talking about our players. And um, Xander Bogars, who's from Aruba, Aruba is a more popular um tourist destination so people are uh, uh um uh, you know there is easier for them to know where aruba is not knowing that curacao is just 40 50 miles west of it you know so um it's 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 an honor to be able to uh you know say that we 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 do a lot to in order to try to refine our talent uh, and and as long as we're going to live we're going to try to uh, bring people like you down to help our volunteers coach our, our kids uh, because we don't have professional baseball there. You know, it's like amateur baseball. Um, we have a lot of options for kids. It's not only baseball. Kids can play all different sports. Um, it's, it's not like Dominican or Colombia or, or Venezuela, one of these other countries. That's all they do, play baseball every day, you know. Um, for instance, my son plays soccer and play, play baseballs. He plays um, rugby. You know, he plays the, the cello. I mean, there is four or five different things he's busy with every day um, and besides uh, baseball only. So, um, you know, he goes to school. So um, and, and most kids in Curacao are like this. So it's even uh, more gratifying for us to see when um, our kids are making it the big leagues uh, when they have so many options. Absolutely. That is awesome. And folks, I've been to Curacao, beautiful island. Talk about a tourist attraction. It is a great place to go to. I love it. Um, you know, and, and what's interesting about that, I love the part that the kids play different sports. They do all kinds of different things. Um, what, what would you say the average uh, 11, 12 year old all year round, just curious, like how many games and how many practices would they have roughly? So that's another thing. We don't play a lot of games. You know, we, we practice way more than we, when we play games uh, because the Little League system international as a rule that you play 11 games a year and that's what they play. You know, the season wow. is 11 games. Um, you cannot have more than 12 teams in each league. So that's why you only play 11 games. Um, and then uh, besides that, there are maybe three or four other tournaments that takes place uh, mm -hmm. over the course of the year that you play maybe three or four games in each tournament. So let's say they play 20, 25 games all year. And then the rest of the time, they're practicing a couple times a week, you know, uh, uh, for the most part, like my son's team practices uh, Tuesday and, and Thursdays. And then the other, you know, um, five days he's doing the other sports and the other activities he's in. And, and so he's doing baseball way less than he's doing the other activities. Um, so that's, that's what we go through. And, and, and that's remarkable that we produce as much by not playing a lot. And, um, you know, right now we're trying to um, do more like our foundation um, has brought RBI baseball for the old, little older kids between 13 and 17. And then we're playing 315 extra games between September and November for these two age groups um, in Curacao to to have them play more games because, you know, um, earlier in the year they're playing on their teams and, um, you know, it's it's we we. We don't cut through the Little League um, season, so we wait for them to finish that. And then there's the same players we used to play the RBI Leagues. Um, and um, it's gone well, you know, uh, with the pandemic, we, we had to rest for two years. Yeah. And then we just played again um, for two months uh, in um, November, December, the end of last year with just the senior division. So um, hopefully we can get back on track this year and play both divisions and, and have them play some three or some extra games. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I'll tell you what, Hensley, you know, um, even with the extra games you guys are scheduling in the future, um, 
the common denominator all over the world, when you look at the top countries in the world, and I mentioned Cuba, and then yes, you can mention the Dominican Republic also, but other countries, and whether it be Canada, or whether it be, you know, uh, you know, even the Netherlands, as you speak, the common denominator at the young age is, and it shows it, and the statistics are out there, that younger kids play less games and practice more. That's important. So I think you guys are on the right track. I think you're doing the right thing. You see it in the countries that are doing that. They're becoming successful um, in developing players. Hey, I, I, we don't have a lot of time. You got to get going too because of spring training. You got a game today. Um, I want to talk real quickly about your new position, assistant hitting coach in the big leagues. What, what does that entail? What's your responsibilities? Well, the um, um, the Yankees hired um, two young hitting coaches. Um, you know, the 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 game has changed uh, a lot in going into the analytics um, um, direction and um, swing changes and things like that. So um, the Yankees didn't stay behind. They hired two two um, coaches that are in the big leagues for the first time in their careers. Uh, so they needed somebody with a little bit of experience, experience that's been through it, that's won. And, you know, that that would help these guys get through the over the hump uh, as they as they start their careers in the major leagues. And I assist them. I, I'm in the cages all day working with all our great hitters. Um, I get out on the field and um, assist there as well with everything that needs to be done. So we got to imagine right now for spring training, there is a lot of people around. Um, I believe we have over 60 players in camp. Um, so there is some 30, some hitters in camp. So that's way more than you have during the season. And one person or even two cannot handle all of that. So besides me, um, um, Dylan Lawson, who's the head hitting coach and, um, Casey Dykes, who's the other assistant. There is, um, two other, um, hitting coaches from the minor league. So there's five of us helping out with all these hitters every day. Uh, for instance, yesterday we played the game on the road in Dunedin against the Blue Jays. And uh, most uh, most of our lineup didn't make the trip, so they stayed home to do their workout at home. So Casey and Dylan stayed home, and I went on the road with the other two uh, minor league hitting coaches to um, run the practice, run the batting practice, um, run the pregame, um, um, getting ready, um, go go over the reports with them uh, from who were they facing. And in this case, yesterday was the Japanese pitcher Kikuchi. Um, that started the game against us. So, we, you know, we go over the report on that. So, But overall, you know, I'm there to help them. I'm, I'm there to assist in um, everything that needs to be done on a daily basis. Yeah, one thing you're seeing, folks, in the big leagues, you're seeing more coaches. I mean, I know uh, I think San Francisco's got 14 major league coaches. It's, uh, it's becoming like basketball, almost one-on-one -on -one now, which I guess is a good thing because, you know, you, like you said, you can't cover all these players, and you guys got great hitters. And I got to ask you this, without – giving away secrets, obviously, you know, I, I, I'm just, as a fan, I love guys like LeMay, who Rizzo, you know, kind of Follett, but, uh, uh, guys like that. I like guys like that because, you know, I'm not a big strikeout guy. I like a lineup with a lot of, you know, contact, a lot of, you know, hit the ball the other way, all that kind of stuff. And then mixed in with, you know, obviously you want power hitters too. Is there, is there, what's the Yankees philosophy? What, um, is it according to each hitter you teach, you know, what they're going to do? Well, you know, the Yankees have always been uh, the nickname Bomber. So they, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're trying to hit the ball over the fence, you know. So, um, um, but in general, the game has changed uh, where they, they don't want to hit ground balls. You know, it's, it's proven that ground balls are outs or converted into outs. They, they pay infielders millions of dollars just to catch the ball and, and, and throw you out. So um, you have a better chance of um, getting the base hit when you hit the ball in the air. Um, either it's a, if it's a fly ball or a line drive and, and it hits the grass in the outfield or it's in the gaps or it's over the fence. So um, that's our philosophy to try to hit the ball in the air. And, um, and no matter if you're kind of Falefa or, you know, or, or, or Gallo or, or Judge or Stanton. So um, all these guys are proven um, great major league hitters. Um, what we need to uh, uh, work on is, is continuity and consistency for all of them. And when they're all on, are on their top of their games, you know, we, we're going to produce, I mean, we're going to produce home runs. We're going to produce extra base hits and that's going to turn into, you know, a high um, hit effects OPS. That's what, that's what we've worked on here in, um, in with the Yankees. So 
Um, that OPS is 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 uh, is big. Um, getting them base is big. Um, the strikeouts are, are are you know not much. Uh, uh, they don't pay much attention to it. I mean, all of, obviously you don't want to strike out. We have a guy like Gallo that strikes out a lot uh, over the years, but um, and 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 also Stanton and and um, Judge they they all they all strike out over hundred times a year. So, um, but. They, they hit 30, 40 homers and drive in 110, 120 runs. And that's what you, you look for. You, you, you don't always um, dwell on the, on the negatives, but you, you see what they can produce for you. And, um, you know, that's why when people say when, when the playoff comes, you know, they need, they need to make more contact, this and that. But, you know, they, I think you play one way and hopefully when you get the playoffs, um, that one way is shows up and it keeps producing for you. You know, it's, it's hard to um, switch philosophies or switch the way who you are, who you, how you go about swinging and hitting um, once you get the playoffs. I think, um, you know, hopefully we'll have a great year this year, get in the playoffs and, and continue to have the same trend um, all the way to the end. Yeah, and like you said, you know, I mean, they're driving in runs. Runs win, run, you know, they win games, right? You got to get runs. So if they're driving in runs like with 34, 40 home runs, that's great. A um, couple more things, then we'll let you run. Uh, you, 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 you obviously coached under, you know, a great manager, Bruce Bocci, um, World Series, you know, champions uh, three times. Just something that you took from him that you bring into your coaching, you know, to learn from him that you really, you know, work on well pay attention to details you know i think uh Boch, um gets a lot of credit for uh paying attention to details um he's a, he's a student of the game um you know he he didn't really get to work too much with the with the analytics as they turned um to a different uh, level right now but i mean we we got to work with it from 15 through 19 in his in his last few years of managing in San Francisco but you know studying the game trying to um, get on track with that as well trying to learn as, as as much as he can and knowing the opposition you know he knew the opposition really well when once the game started who bonnet who stole who um, who could pull the ball who couldn't pull the ball who can hit lefties who couldn't have lefties um, so he he was very prepared when once the game started and that's what I try to do on a daily basis. You know, I, I prepare myself really well um, not to miss anything once the game starts. All right. Finally, last one, Hensley, we'll let you run. Um, you got a Chicago kid there as your manager, um, Joe Girardi. You know, I played against him. He was at Northwestern. He, he doesn't know me, but I played against him. And, um, you know, I'm curious. I know you just started there, you know, with him. Curious, some takeaways, uh, why he's been successful also as a manager. Well, Girard is with the Phillies. I'm with oh, that's um, right. I, Aaron Boone. <laughs> yeah, it's too, it's too early in the morning for me. What am I thinking? Girardi. Yeah. What, what. Sorry, folks. We, we all make mistakes, and I made a big one there, so life goes on. All right? Hey, uh, and it's not my first one, Hensley. Well, so let's jump to Boone then, right? Boone, another guy who came well, as a player. Well, Aaron um, has been a good player, a good manager. He's won a lot of games already in his career as a, as the Yankee manager. Uh, won over 100 games both both the first and second years. Um, you know, team that was playoff bound every year. Um, he's he's got a calm presence about him, um, but but um, very direct. You know, very direct for the few uh, days that I've been here working with him. I think uh, players respect him. Uh, he comes from a, a great baseball family with his brother and his father. I think his grandfather playing. Um, so uh, he's got a wealth of baseball um, um, in his brain. Um, he brings it out every day. We, we do a lot of dinners together every night, almost every night, just to get to know each other better and also um, get to know him um, better, how he likes to run his ship. So um, I have nothing but respect for him. I know uh, him and I were... Um, interviewed to be the manager for the Yankees last. And, um, you know, he, he won the position, but I think working on the same staff with him now uh, makes me realize that, um, you know, the right the Yankees made the right choice by picking him. And um, now we're both in the same staff working to, to bring a championship back to the Bronx. 
Yeah, and like you said, man, that circle goes around, right? And all of a sudden, you get it back together. And folks, if you, right. can, uh, you probably do think that the show was scripted because then Hensley just got done talking about make sure that you're prepared and you and you prepare yourself. Well, I wasn't really prepared, was I? Because I mentioned Girardi. So that kind of fell in perfectly. Hey, Hensley, thanks, buddy, man. Get the work. I know you got a lot of stuff going on. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Nice talking to you guys. All right, folks, Hensley Mullins, uh, special thanks to him, of course. Special thanks to Brian Crock, our producer with the Lineup Media Group. Special thanks to everybody in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, don't forget, go to BaseballOutsideTheBox.com. Check it out. Also, go to Baseball Outside the Box YouTube. You got Peter Caliendo YouTube. You got Facebook, Twitter. Check us out. Thank you, everybody. Uh, tomorrow, 3.30 Central Time. Let me tell you. Uh, tomorrow, 3.30 Thursday, Central Time, we are going to have Nancy Finley, um, the daughter of the brother of Charles Finley, the owner of and the Hall of Fame owner of the Oakland A's. So check it out. Be safe. Be healthy. And we will see you on tomorrow's show.